2013, 17-year-old Dylan Shoemaker brutally killed his girlfriend's son. During his sentencing, Shoemaker sobbed and claimed he never meant to hurt the boy. But everybody in the courtroom soon learned that his tears were nothing but an evil scheme. Here are 10 teenage convicts reacting to life sentences. Number 10. Shondell Jackson July 6, 2009, Nathan Porter, a student from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, was walking into his apartment in the River West neighborhood when he was robbed at gunpoint. Once the robbers found out that Potter had no money, they fatally shot him. During the investigation, witnesses identified 18-year-old Shondell Jackson from a group of photos as the one who pulled the trigger. In addition, shell casings found at the scene matched a gun that Jackson illegally possessed. Investigators also discovered that someone named Derek Thomas, also known as D, was with Jackson during the incident. Derek Thomas, aka D, was consequently arrested in connection with Nathan Potter's murder. Thomas wasted no time in turning against his partner in crime, confessing to the police that he and Jackson had met up on July 5th with the intention of robbing people because Jackson needed money and had a gun. Later that night, while casing a bar on Deusman Street, they spotted Potter walking around 2500 North Deusman at around 1 a.m. Thomas, acting as a lookout, witnessed Jackson approach Potter and shoot him with a 45 caliber handgun after he discovered he had no money. Afterward, the pair fled to Thomas's house and nonchalantly played video games like that just didn't happen. In addition to his damning confession against Jackson, Thomas also helped the police catch him. February 2010, a jury found Shondell Jackson guilty of first-degree intentional homicide and robbery. But it would be during his sentence hearing a couple of months later that showed his true colors. Sometimes courtrooms can be quite dramatic when a sentence is read out. But Jackson's reaction was nothing short of insane. After getting a life sentence without the possibility of parole, Jackson became violent, displaying a complete disregard for the severity of his actions. Extended supervision. I know that that is something that is reserved for the most serious of cases, and I... Jackson displayed a complete lack of remorse or sorrow throughout the trial, both for his crime and for the victim. As the judge gave her speech, he coldly turned around and cursed at the victim's family, as well as at Milwaukee County Circuit Judge Rebecca Dallet. The scene escalated quickly, with three deputies and Milwaukee police detective James Hutchinson forcefully dragging Jackson to the floor of the courtroom. Jackson had to be restrained by officers who used pepper spray to control him. He didn't stop at that, though. As he was escorted out of the courtroom, he smirked and continued cursing at the Potter family. While his reaction was indeed intense, he wasn't the only one. Members of his family in the back of the courtroom started hurling insults at Potter's mother, saying, I hate you, I hate you all, and God's the judge, in addition to that life sentence he received. Jackson was also given five years in prison for attempted robbery and another five years for an unrelated non-fatal shooting that occurred on the same day Potter was killed. As of now, there's a petition advocating for Shondell Jackson, aiming for a resentencing. The petition argues that a life in prison without the possibility of parole for people aged between 18 and 20 and younger is both cruel and unusual punishment. Now, considering what we just saw in court, do you believe Shondell really deserves a second chance? Number 9. Conrad Schaefer June 26, 2013, at just 15, Conrad Schaefer went on a shooting spree in Kissimmee, Florida that left two dead, just because he thought it'd be fun. Schaefer's first victim was David Guerrero, who was gunned down while on his way to catch a bus for work. His death wasn't enough to satisfy Schaefer's twisted desires, so he decided to kill again just a few days later. July 3rd, Schaefer and three friends, David Damos, Victoria Rios, and Juan Muriel, forced their way into Eric Rupinarin's Point Siena home. Once inside, Damos shot Eric in the head with Schaefer's gun and Schaefer slit the man's throat. Initially, the police couldn't connect the two murders until they stumbled upon a 45 caliber rifle that was used to shoot both victims. It turned out that the rifle belonged to Conrad Schaefer's father, who later confessed that his son had stolen it. July 19, 2013, 
The police finally apprehended Conrad Schaefer, and to their shock, he admitted that he'd been on the lookout for random targets and found it amusing to shoot someone. What's even more chilling here is that the police managed to arrest Schaefer just as he was attempting to obtain more ammunition. Schaefer was given two counts of first-degree murder, invasion with a firearm, and grand theft for the murder of Eric Rubnerin. He was also charged with multiple drive-by shootings in Kissing Me, but thankfully no one was injured. As the investigation progressed, the police discovered that the gun used in the killings was purchased by Conrad's father, Lothar Schaefer, just two days before the first murder. That raised suspicions that maybe the father knew about his son's intentions. August 2013, Lothar Schaefer was arrested for negligence and allowing the unlawful possession of a firearm. He claimed that he bought the gun for himself, but Conrad stole it. He also said that he was deeply disturbed by his son's actions. Eventually, he was given four months in jail and two years on probation. Purchasing a firearm is one thing, but you also have the right to make sure it's secure and out of the hands of those that shouldn't have it, said Kissing Me Police Chief Lee Massey. The result of Mr. Schaefer not securing his firearm is we've had two homicides and what could have been tragically many more. As for Conrad Schaefer, he pled guilty to the double murder and had to wait for three years to be sentenced. April 15th, 2016, during the hearing, Schaefer was overwhelmed with emotions, crying as his father and families of the victims addressed the court. He also made a statement to apologize to the victims' families, expressing remorse for the pain he had caused. I wish it never happened. I wish I could take it back. I wish I could change things, but I can't. I'm really sorry. Because Schaefer was a juvenile at the time of the killings, his attorney had pushed for a sentence of 40 years, arguing that Schaefer had matured considerably since the killings and showed signs that he could be rehabilitated. However, the judge thought otherwise and proceeded with the sentencing to two consecutive life terms in prison for that double murder. As he was escorted out of the courtroom, Conrad Schaefer looked utterly shocked. The state prosecutor, Jeff Ashton, was satisfied with the outcome, saying, Maybe someday we'll know why people like Mr. Schaefer exist. But for the safety of this community, under that answer is known. Mr. Schaefer can't be free. Our next teenage convict on the list committed a double murder. However, when we compare notes, it becomes clear that the judge showed more mercy in Schaefer's case. Number 8. Dexter Johnson On June 18, 2006, just a few days after turning 18, Mr. Dexter committed a brutal double murder that would ultimately land him on death row. Now, Johnson and his four friends were cruising around Houston on the lookout for someone to rob. That's when they stumbled upon Maria Aparece and Hui Ngong, who were chilling in Aparece's Toyota near her house. Johnson, armed with a shotgun, approached that vehicle, threatening to shoot the couple if they didn't let him and his two friends inside that car. Then they took off in Aparece's car, demanding money from the terrified couple. With the other two friends tailing him in their own vehicle, Johnson found a secluded area where he decided to stop. It was there that he assaulted Aparece. Johnson, accompanied by one of his buddies, then forced the couple into the woods and fatally shot him both in the head. After the cold-blooded killings, the group used a credit card they had stolen from the victims at two different Walmarts. So their luck ran out when authorities managed to track down her car, leading to their capture just a few days later. These murders were just a small part of the crime spree that lasted 25 days, according to Harris County prosecutors. They believed that Johnson and his crew were also responsible for at least two other murders, as well as a series of violent robberies and kidnappings. July 2007, Dexter Johnson was found guilty of capital murder and was sentenced to death. After the decision was read, he gazed up and pressed his lips together, his eyes filled with tears. Then he looked toward his family and lifted his hand as if to wave to them. I hereby assess your punishment of death. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is going to complete your jury service. I'm going to meet you in the jury room. Then out of nowhere, he chucks his chair across the room. In that split second, many officers tackled him, while the rest worked to restore order. His relatives wailed, and a male voice begged, don't kill him. Some relatives buckled over and were sobbing as he was let out of court. Since his conviction, Johnson has filed and lost several appeals in state and federal court. 
August 15, 2019 at 6 p.m., Dexter was scheduled to be executed by lethal injection. However, a federal appellate court halted the execution less than 24 hours before he was set to die. The court then stayed his execution and sent the case back to the district court to look into newly raised claims of intellectual disability. In recent appeals, Johnson has urged that he's intellectually disabled and therefore ineligible for the death penalty under U.S. Supreme Court precedent. His attorney mentioned recent IQ and neuropsychological tests putting Johnson's IQ below the threshold of intellectual disability. He also noted several limitations in language skills and a pronounced stutter. In deciding to stop the execution, the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals listed numerous deficits Johnson had, such as struggling to articulate words and not being able to follow bus directions or manage money. The judges also noted that an expert witness at trial claimed Johnson wasn't intellectually disabled disabled said he would no longer testify to that. But the stay of execution doesn't state that Johnson is ineligible for the death penalty. Instead, the case went back to the district court for further examination of the appeal. However, no new actions have been taken regarding the case. As of January 2024, Dexter Johnson is still on death row. Number 7. Nicholas Lindsay February 21st, 2011, at 16, Nicholas Lindsay brutally murdered Officer David Crawford. As a result, he wasn't given just one, but three life sentences. It all started when Crawford responded to a call about a suspicious person near Tropicana Field in Florida. It was late at night, and the caller reported seeing a man with a brick in his backyard who then hopped over the fence. The caller suspected it was a potential burglar. So Crawford wasted no time, quickly arriving at the scene. He spotted that individual and stepped out of his vehicle. However, at 10.37 p.m., Officer Donald J. Ziegler witnessed and reported an exchange of gunfire. When he arrived on scene, Ziegler found Crawford had been shot many times at close range. Over 200 officers from various agencies across Tampa Bay joined forces to launch an extensive manhunt for the suspect. February 22, 2011, the manhunt finally came to an end thanks to tips from the community. Acting on the information, the police raided a house and apprehended Nicholas Lindsay. Initially, Lindsay provided conflicting accounts of the events, but eventually he confessed to the details that aligned with the evidence gathered by the police. It was also reported that Lindsay broke down in tears, even admitting to getting rid of the gun in a nearby creek. Lindsay's mom, Deneen Sweat, informed the St. Petersburg Times that she had a suspicion that her son might have been involved in the shooting after hearing the suspect's description. I told my son man up and tell what happened. People started questioning how this 16-year-old had access to a gun, and they would also start debating about whether he should be tried as an adult. According to records, Lindsay had a previous criminal record for nonviolent offenses like grand theft and trespassing. March 23, 2012, Lindsay was found guilty of the murder and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole due to Florida's Law Enforcement Protection Act. He couldn't be sentenced to death because of a 2005 U.S. Supreme Court ruling prohibiting executing individuals for crimes committed while they were under 18. Or has significant doubts about the defendant's potential for rehabilitation. Cited aggravating circumstances, including including an escalating criminal history before he sentenced Lindsay to that second term with no chance of parole. But Lindsay actually grinned when the judge read his ruling, the lack of remorse not lost on David Crawford's daughter, Amanda. A year later, Lindsay's life sentence was upheld in court after an appeal. January 20th, 2017, an IQ test puts him between 77 and 86, which is below the average person. As a result, his attorneys requested for his sentence to be reduced to 40 years. However, Lindsay's life sentence was again upheld, and the judge stated that that sentence would be reviewed in 2036 after 25 years served. Number 6. Martise Fuller 2019, 15-year-old Martise Fuller took the life of his girlfriend Kaylee Juga and left her mother severely injured because he blamed him for his expulsion from school and removal from the football team. Martise and Kaylee would meet during their freshman year. Fuller was the talented quarterback and Kaylee was the cheerleader. They began dating, but their romance was short-lived. Fuller soon became possessive and their relationship took a violent turn. He would even start stalking her at school and work. Things escalated to a point where he eventually was expelled from high school. The official explanation was that he made intimidating and threatening comments toward Kaylee. After that, Fuller snapped, believing he needed to get back at her for ruining his life. May 9, 2019, Kaylee and her mother Stephanie were at home. 
Kaylee had finally started feeling safe again after dealing with months of creepy stalking and harassment. Now, Fuller had a friend drop him off about 10 blocks away from their place at around 1 p.m. He snuck into their open garage and made his way straight to Kaylee's room. And then out of nowhere, he mercilessly shot her five times. Stephanie later said she heard what she described as a blood-curdling scream, followed by a loud bang. She ran into that hallway and came face to face with Fuller. In a desperate plea, she begged him, please, you don't have to do this. Fuller then went after Stephanie, who ran into the bathroom. As she desperately tried to lock the door, he fired a couple of shots, hitting her in the arm as she managed to slam that door shut. Fuller then quickly fled the scene. At around 3 p.m., the Kenosha County Sheriff's Department received a report of a shooting and quickly dispatched officers to the scene. Upon arrival, the deputy saw the garage door was open and decided to enter the house. To his horror, he discovered Kaylee lying on the floor of her room, suffering from her gunshot wounds. Despite the best efforts of medical personnel, Kaylee succumbed to those injuries and was pronounced dead at the scene. He would also find Stephanie seriously wounded but miraculously still alive. Now, Following that shooting, a cousin brought Fuller to a relative's house in Racine, where he was arrested the following day. According to prosecutors, Fuller had planned the attack weeks in advance. He had planned to get a firearm and ammunition from a friend, and even had a relative dispose of that gun, which was later confirmed by the state crime lab to be the weapon used in the shooting. He was given first-degree intentional homicide, use of a dangerous weapon, attempted first-degree intentional homicide, and burglary. Fuller's trial faced many delays due to allegation of jury tampering. Prosecutors were claiming Fuller was caught making jail phone calls, attempting to contact three jurors. As a result, he faced additional charges. May 19, 2021, Fuller was found guilty. During his hearing, his defense attorney requested that the judge consider granting him the chance for release in 25 to 30 years. However, the judge ultimately decided to impose the max penalty of life in prison without the possibility of parole. She stated that Fuller is a very dangerous and damaged human being who poses a significant threat to society. I have no ethos, no regret, no sorrow, no empathy. You are for you and no one else. When the verdict was announced, Fuller couldn't hold back his emotions. He broke down, crying, and buried his head in front of him on the table. This was the only time he ever showed any emotion throughout the entire case. Number 5. Jennifer Me. 2007, when Jennifer here was just 15 years old, she became an overnight sensation due to her uncontrollable hiccups. This girl was hiccuping at 50 times a minute. Now, this teen from St. Petersburg, Florida, appeared on many TV shows across the U.S., desperately seeking a cure for her mysterious condition. However, after five long weeks, the hiccups finally stopped, and so did the attention. Life seemed to return to normal for Jennifer, or so it seemed. 2010. Jennifer Mee was back again in the headlines. This time, however, it was for an entirely different reason. She was charged with first-degree murder in connection with the death of a 22-year-old man she had met online. Jennifer had lured this unsuspecting victim, Shannon Griffin, to an abandoned house under the pretense of buying marijuana. Tragically, two of her friends joined in on that plan, robbing and shooting Griffin. He was brutally shot four times, all for less than $50. Now, under Florida law, a person can be convicted of a murder if he or she committed a serious felony crime such as robbery and someone was killed as a result. And so Jennifer was held equally responsible for the crime because she had played a role in setting it up. The prosecutors presented evidence from police interviews and recorded phone calls between Jennifer and her mother, Rachel Robidoux, to prove that she had orchestrated the entire incident. Now, during the call, she told her mom she didn't pull the trigger that killed Griffin, but she got charged with murder. Because I set everything up, she explained in the call that the jury heard. It all went wrong, mom. It just went downhill. Now, her lawyer said that she had schizophrenia and Tourette syndrome. And a psychiatrist appointed by the court said Mee's intelligence was below average. Her attorney, John Trevina, also said she was taking a medication called Thorazine, which is typically used to treat psychotic disorders, maybe to control her hiccups. And she had serious side effects. He wanted me to plead guilty in exchange for a 15-year sentence. 
but things didn't go as planned. 2013, Mi was found guilty of first-degree murder and received a life sentence without parole. Her co-defendants were also convicted of first-degree felony murder and got life sentences. Mi couldn't hold back her tears when the sentence was announced. Red, she was obviously hoping that the jury would convict her on a lesser charge, perhaps accessory to murder or manslaughter. Now, though, she'll spend the rest of her life behind bars for the murder of Shannon Griffin. Her attorney moved for a new trial, which was subsequently denied. Now, currently, there's an ongoing petition calling for a resentence for Jennifer Mee, as many believe that her involvement in this murder was minimal. According to that petition, her supporters argue, We feel in this case a mandatory sentence doesn't do anything but punish with no allowance for her to show remorse or to change from the girl she was then to the woman she is today. Number 4 Dylan Shoemaker, March 19, 2013. A tragic incident occurred in Springville, New York. Dylan Shoemaker, 17 years old, was entrusted with the care of his girlfriend's two sons, Austin and Christopher Smith. However, things took a dark turn when Shoemaker, in a moment of anger, ended up brutally killing Austin. When Shoemaker's girlfriend Ashley came home from work that night, she found that her son Austin was dead. Her boyfriend Dylan Shoemaker had beaten him to death. Shoemaker was arrested for that heinous crime. However, he maintained that it was an accident and that he never intended to harm Austin. I would give my life for Austin. I loved him. And during his trial, Shoemaker, taking the stand in his own defense, testified that he had become frustrated with Austin because of his loud crying, so he put a pillow over the boy's head to stop him from crying. This guy had the audacity to tell the jury that he didn't mean to kill Austin or even realize that his actions could lead to such a tragic outcome. But that was a little hard to believe because he also snapped, spanked, and eventually slammed him on the floor, punching him several times in the head through the pillow. And so it didn't come as a surprise that the jury didn't believe him. January 2014, Dylan Shoemaker was found guilty of second-degree murder and was given the max life sentence of 25 years to life. I didn't mean to kill Austin. Ashley, I really did it. That sentence, however, came as a shock to Shoemaker, who believed he would have had an easy time getting away with it because he was just a 16-year-old white guy. During a recorded call with his mother, Shoemaker confidently told her that he believed that his appearance alone could win over the sympathy of the jury. Probably all I have to do is cry and then they're gonna feel sorry for me, Shoemaker told her. During the trial, Shoemaker indeed cried a lot. However, it quickly became evident to everyone that these were nothing more than crocodile tears. After hearing the phone call, the judge Judge called Shoemaker a manipulator and deceiver before handing down the max sentence. 2016. Despite his chilling comments and lack of genuine remorse, Dylan Shoemaker's sentence was reduced to 18 years to life. This means he might be able to get parole in the year 2031. Number 3. Philip Chisholm October 22, 2013, at just 14, Philip Chisholm followed his math teacher, Colleen Ritzer, into the school's bathroom, strangled her, stabbed her at least 16 times, and sexually assaulted her, all before dumping her corpse behind the school. Fall of 2013, Chisholm moved from Tennessee to Danvers, Massachusetts. Apart from being a good soccer player, nobody really knew this kid that well. He had a hard time adapting to the new environment, and was described by others as antisocial or out of it. On the other hand, we have Colleen Ritzer, known for her positive and caring nature. She always went above and beyond to help her students, including Chisholm. In fact, just before the incident, Ritzer had complimented him on his drawing skills and offered to assist him in preparing for the upcoming test. Little did she know that this kid had already set his sinister plan in motion. At the end of the school day, Chisholm followed her into the school's toilet, wielding a box cutter. Chisholm robbed assaulted and brutally killed her, then rolled her body in a garbage can to the woods behind the school. Chisholm then took himself into town and bought a movie ticket with her credit card. Then he left the theater and went to steal a knife from another store, possibly with another victim in mind. Fortunately, he never had that chance. At 12.30 a.m., while walking alone a dark highway outside Danvers, he was stopped by police during a routine safety check. During a frisk for ID, the police found Ritzer's credit card and driver's license in his possession. 
possession. They took him straight to the local station where they searched his backpack and discovered Ritzer's purse and underwear, along with the box cutter covered in dried blood. When asked about the ownership of the box cutter, Chisholm casually replied, It's the girls. When questioned about her whereabouts, he chillingly stated, She's buried in the woods. At 3 a.m., the police found her mute body, partially covered with leaves, near a pair of stained white gloves. A handwritten note was found nearby that read, I hate you all. Philip Chisholm was charged with first-degree murder, aggravated assault, and armed robbery. February 26, 2016, he was found guilty, given the minimum of 40 years in prison. Chisholm didn't show any emotion when that sentence was read out. Colleen Richard and Murdo were inextricably intertwined. This court may not punish the defendant with more prison time for the rape. Justice but honestly, it wasn't surprising at all because throughout the whole case, it was pretty clear that he had absolutely zero regard for human life. Antonio Barbo and Nathan Pop. 2012, 78-year-old great-grandmother Barbara Olson was bludgeoned to death with a hatchet and hammer in her home in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. Now, what was truly shocking here was the revelation of who the murder was perpetrated by. Barbara's very own 13-year-old great-grandson, Antonio Barbo, and his best friend, Nathan Pop. September 17th, 2012, Nathan's unsuspecting mother drove the two boys to Barbara's neighborhood. When Nathan's mother was out of sight, the boys snuck into Barbara's garage. They had intended on sneaking up on her through the door that led from the garage to the kitchen. However, Barbara heard the boys and invited them into the house, adding that she would call Antonio's mother to let her know that he was with her. When Barbara turned her back on Antonio and Nathan, she was brutally attacked by the duo, which had brought along their weapons of choice a hatchet and hammer. Now, following the heinous attack, the two boys attempted to drag her blood-soaked body to the car, which was parked in the garage. Realizing that that wasn't an easy feat, they decided to ditch her body in the garage with a trail of blood leading from inside the house. They would steal a mere $155 as well as several pieces of jewelry. After they stuffed the pitiful bounty into their pockets, they grabbed her car keys and dumped her unlocked car at a nearby Sheboygan bowling alley. Inside the car, they abandoned a few pieces of jewelry in the hopes that somebody would steal the unlocked vehicle and then be implicated in her murder. What do two teenagers do with a pitiful $155 stolen from the elderly lady they just slaughtered? They buy weed and pizza. It wouldn't be until two days later that Barbara's body was found by one of her daughters. Within 12 hours, Nathan and Antonio were apprehended for her murder after bloody clothes and shoes were discovered in Antonio's locker. An investigation of Nathan's home brought out more bloody clothes as well as Barbara's gold watch. Nathan and Antonio were both given first-degree murder as adults. January 2013, Antonio entered a plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. Two weeks later, Nathan also entered a plea of not guilty. As the trial date loomed, Antonio changed his plea to no contest as part of a deal with the state that would see him eligible for parole in 35 years. He was convicted of first-degree intentional homicide. August 2013, Nathan Pop was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide and was given life in prison for his role in the murder. Despite pleading, he only took part in that brutal slaying so that his partner in crime, Antonio, wouldn't turn on him. Despite all efforts taken by Antonio's family and defense team to get him a more lenient sentence, he was also sentenced to life in prison. So when the two turn 49 years old, they'll have their shot at parole. They'll get a second chance at life, something they denied Barbara Olson as she begged the young boy that she helped raise from birth. However, sadly, they weren't the only teens on this list who were capable of committing such a dreadful act and taking the life of one of their loved ones. And number one, Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero. April 9th, 2021, Sierra and her boyfriend Aaron murdered and later burned the body of Sierra's father, Daniel Halseth. After they fled the scene, her grandmother, Christine Halseth, contacted Sierra. She was worried because she couldn't reach her son. Sierra, I'm trying to get hold of your dad. Where is he? Christine Halseth wrote, No answer, so I left a message to text or call. His phone's been acting up, but he's okay. It should all be fixed by tomorrow. 
tomorrow night. No worries, reportedly came Sierra's reply. Thank you so much for getting back to me. Love you. But after several more unanswered texts, Christine did get worried and sent someone over to check. That's when Daniel's burnt body, stabbed and cut 70 times, was found in the garage of his northwest Las Vegas home. Turns out the police didn't have to look too far to find the killer. At the scene, police found multiple receipts from Winco Supermarket and Home Depot for items like bleach, both a circular saw and a chainsaw, lighter fluid, and gloves. Then by reviewing CCTV at the stores, police saw videos that showed Halseth and Guerrero with bleach, a circular saw, and lighter fluid. They also found surveillance of Halseth using her father's debit cards. But what was it that drove Sierra to kill her own father? Reports did reveal that Daniel had learned that Sierra was planning to run away from home with her boyfriend, Aaron Guerrero. And so he told her that he didn't want her to see or contact him again. The couple had managed to evade capture for a few days, fleeing to Utah after committing their heinous act. They were eventually arrested by Utah Transit Authority because they hadn't paid their fares on a light rail train in the downtown area. Background checks revealed that the pair was wanted in Las Vegas. After confiscating Sierra's phone, investigators came across a disturbing video in which the couple admitted to the murder and apparently were even planning to upload that video on YouTube. The audacity of this person, joking and laughing about killing her dad. During that trial, the teenage couple pled guilty to nine counts each, including murder with a deadly weapon and first-degree arson. However, they claimed that Daniel Halseth had abused and mistreated his daughter, which they believe justified their decision to kill him. But what made those claims unbelievable to everybody was the fact that Sierra and her boyfriend stabbed Daniel over 70 times, put that body in a sleeping bag, and tried dismantling with a chain and circular saw before setting it on fire. Sierra's family was devastated by the false accusation she made against her own father, who, according to them, always tried his best to make her happy. They even told the judge that she should receive the max penalty. October 20th, 2022. Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero both received life sentences with the possibility of parole after 20 years. During that hearing, Aaron was seen shedding tears, while Sierra, on the other hand, despite being responsible for her father's death, did not shed a single tear.